Welcome to the pre-dawn glorious gloriousness. That is the African bush. Uh, we're out in search of all the wonderful creatures of the African wild. There's been lions roaring overnight, so hopefully they make an appearance. So come join us on the adventure. This is Safari Live. Welcome to a wonderful adventure here in the middle of the African bush. This is a live safari. And uh, the other morning we had a dark post-apocalyptic sky. And this morning we have a pink and fluffy marshmallow-like sky. So a much happier feeling around. And hopefully uh, the not so pink, but the fluffy cats are going to be out and about on this absolutely gorgeous winter's morning here in the Greater Kruger National Park. Now James is on the other vehicle with Veerman, and they've headed up to the north. Uh, we could hear lions roaring there a short time ago. Uh, on camera with me today, of course, is uh, the thumb, accompanied by Brian Joubert. My name is Brent Leo Smith, and we're going to head down to the east. I've got a hankering for a spotted cat. I've got a feeling the cheetah might appear on Cheetah Plains, the Sunrise Safari. So we're going to meander our way down there. We're obviously going to look for anything else before we get there. So we're just having a quick look through the core area of Queen Karula, the dominant female leopard's territory. And if no luck here, we'll hit the long road to the east. So let's get going, see what wonderful creatures are out and about this morning. Now, I'm really hoping James has some luck with the Inkahuma Pride. And of course, yesterday was one of the most incredible moments for me on Safari Live uh, when the three youngest Inkahuma cubs were introduced to the Pride for the first time. It was absolutely spectacular and very special to be able to witness something that you don't get to witness that often. And I'm hoping James has some fantastic sightings in that area, this sunrise safari. I said we're going to have a quick run down to the east. If we get no luck there with either cheetah, the sticks, or any of the resident leopards down there, we will beetle back uh, to the north and work on Juma a bit more. Now, so far, all I've heard were those lions roaring not so long ago. I'm just having a quick double check for any leopard tracks in this area. And remember, hashtag Safari Live on Twitter, or you can use the email address questions at wildearth.tv if you'd like to ask us about any of the fantastic creatures, climate, trees, or any ponderings about the African bush. Uh, remember, we are completely interactive and we'd love to hear from you. Also, remember to tell us where you're from. Uh, we love hearing where in the world you might be located and joining us on the world's largest safari vehicle. And while we start making our way down to the eastern part of the reserve, uh, let's go see how Commander Bond is faring in the north. Good morning, elephants. We are surrounded by a herd of elephants, everybody. Welcome to this part of the Sunrise Safari. It's marvellous to have you on board with us. My name is James Hendry. On camera today is Viam Durenbrak. Hello, Viam. <laughs> Viam is... Um, He's still dressed for winter, but it is quite summery today, I must say. It feels like it's probably 
I don't know, about 16 degrees, 61 Fahrenheit or so. No scarf this morning, and um, it's just a glorious day as these gentle clouds float across the dawn sky, and elephants have greeted us here perfectly in the grey dawn. You can see them in the grey vegetation. 100 shades of grey, <laughs> as opposed to 50. Get it? Yeah? Mm -hmm. Do you get my joke? Yeah. Yes. Now we're as live as Brent is, which means you must talk to us, please. Hashtag Safari Live. There is a minute elephant. Hashtag Safari Live. Questions at wildearth.tv. That is a tiny little thing, everyone. This is a perfect way to start a morning with elephants. They are peaceful at the moment, which is brilliant. They are not angry with us, which is the best. One doesn't want angry elephants in the morning. One doesn't want angry elephants ever, actually. Let's just go and see this little one. I don't want to get too close to this cow here. She's obviously a little bit nervous. She's now moving away slightly from us. And I want to let this fellow, this tuskless fellow, come across before we get in between him and the herd. Now that tuskless condition is quite interesting and there are a few elephants in this area that have no tusks. And I wonder, there's a very large female somewhere around here that has no tusks. And I wonder if this chap isn't related to her. And I say that because the condition of not having tusks, of course, is genetic. In the same way that uh, male pattern baldness is genetic, Viam. Male pattern baldness. Yes, I've got that. Yes, Eggsy and I have that. Let's move on and see if we can see this little one. That one's now slightly nervous of us, which we don't really like, but he's okay. Yes. The little one is suckling. Hello, Annie. You want to know if this is Benjamin Button? I don't think so. Let's have a look. Um, might be, Vian. He could be Benjamin Button. For those of you who don't know what Annie's um, talking about, Benjamin Button is a he's an elephant that looks like he's got old before his time. He's actually, ironically, got slightly fewer wrinkles than the average elephant, uh, but he does look like he's got a kind of uh, lattice work of strange. Uh, strange crinkles on his skin that makes him look older. That could well be him. I think he might be a bit small though. It's possible that that little elephant is too small. I'm not sure. There are a few of them that look like that. And I'm getting I'm getting uh, conf confirmation from the final control where Luis is back at the helm being ably assisted by Kirsten the Red Devil and apparently this is not Benjamin Button. This is a very small elephant, everyone. He's probably about six months old. And see how comfortable he clearly is. I'm just saying he could easily be a she. I'll just use he because I've started using he. See how comfortable he is with the rest of the herd. His mum has moved away. She's now eating further in front, and he has happily moved off to one of his aunts or one of his cousins, possibly even a sister. And they tolerate him, they will watch him, and they will look after him. And this is what I think people find so amazingly appealing about elephants. They are so human in that way. They look after the little ones. Well, I mean, there are lots of human societies that don't, I suppose, but... We quite like the trait in animals when they look after little ones, especially helpless or the sick and lame and infirm. It's exactly what elephants do. And we tend to feel a great kinship with animals that behave in a similar way to us. Hello, Red. Um, a good question from you about tuskless elephants. I'm just going to move forward here and just see this little one's mum. You say, are tuskless elephants at a disadvantage when they fight compared with their tusked colleagues? Absolutely. 
It doesn't matter so much for the cows because they don't use their tusks a great deal for fighting. They use them far more for what this cow is using her tusks for, for eating, for breaking off bark, for trapping bits of vegetation between the tusks and the trunk. But for a bull, yes, most certainly. And while too small ain't too good, too big ain't too good either for fighting. You know those massive tuskers that used to exist in this area. And we'll certainly do in some places. I think Kenya, Amboseli in Kenya's got a number of, still got some pretty impressive tuskers. You know those big tusks that drag on the ground sometimes. The elephant's really got to pick his head up to lift them. Those aren't very good for fighting either. Whether they're attractive to females or not, I don't know. But certainly, um, I would imagine the most effective fighting tusks would be some fairly long, thick ones that stick out at the angle that that cow's tusks stick out. But that, remember, the main function of the tusks, yes, of course, there's a the defensive element to it, but most of the time, elephants are using them to feed, to peel bark off. Now, one of the animals we have really struggled to find of late is the greatest scavenger in Africa. I'm not talking about the human being, I'm talking about the hyena. It's gone, Brian. Where did it go? Well, it just walked into the little Mwadi uh, River. Uh, here we go. Oh, hello. This hyena is blind in its left eye. On patrol, marching along the roads. And you can see the opaque left eye of the spotted hyena. Now that could be from an injury, it could be from a snake. It could be from a hereditary disease. Now I'm wondering if this hyena's smelt or spotted here. Yeah, and it's exactly what I wasn't hoping. We're on the southern edge of our traverse area. And that hyena's nose is better than my eyes, but I did see something that made me stop. And we saw the hyena walking through to us, and uh, we might hear some excited laughter. And I just want to check. Oh no, the hyena, is it going to miss it? It's going to come out behind us. I need to have a, a closer look at something on the road when. Let's just turn around. So, as James said, the greatest scavenger in Africa. Now, one of the more interesting and little known facts about the spotted hyena in certain parts of Africa, uh, lions actually scavenge 50% of their food from hyenas. So, a lion is not adverse to getting a free meal and will happily scavenge from any of the other predators. Now, where did spots go? Last place we saw it was where, Brian? Right here. Right there. Look at that. Stopping, listening. Now, I know a lot of our regular viewers know the hyenas very well. And has anyone seen this hyena before with the blind left eye? Well, unfortunately, that hyena is heading down to the south. But if anyone has seen this hyena before with the blind left eye, please let me know. Use the hashtag Safari Live on Twitter or send it in by email, questions at wildearth.tv. Now, as James was saying, we've struggled to see hyena recently. They have moved their den to the north of us, and hopefully they will be back soon. Now, this is right down in the south of, our, of Juma, and it's more than likely part of the Juma clan's territory but I'm sure there's another hyena clan uh, that also comes in from the, from the south, but 
I'm not sure. So let me know if you've seen that hyena before. Now, maybe the hyena knows something I don't because I saw something on the road that got me quite excited. And I need to figure out whether in the early morning light my eyes were playing tricks on me because that hyena, if it is what I thought it was, should have been on it immediately because it walked straight across where it went. Um, I haven't had a good chance to look at it, but do you see what I'm looking at, Brian? But I think, judging from the hyena's reaction, it's not what I originally thought it was. I think it's something, well, it depends. As interesting, probably not as interesting if we're looking for big cats. I initially thought that might be a drag mark, so of a leopard that's caught something and now dragged it across. But now that I can actually have a closer look, it's not at all. And it is absolutely fascinating. I just want to see which way this one is going. So how I'm looking for which way, whatever this is going, I'm looking for a little stick or a little bit of or a stone like that that's been moved. So I can see, unfortunately, this creature was heading to the south. You can just see how that stone's moved a little bit, left a little indentation behind it. Now this, judging by the stomach size, which is about the size of my hand, is probably a good three and a half, four meter African rock python. Now, sometimes they don't go too far. And uh, if it was going into Juma, I would track it a bit further, but it is unfortunately leaving our traverse area. But I've seen something that gives me an excuse to, to cross the boundary. And look in this little thicket. Yeah, a little bit of rubbish, but very, very cool. Uh, we haven't seen too many snake tracks because it's been winter, but the last little while it's warmed up quite a bit. So we are st starting to see snake tracks. I had a snake in the kitchen two nights ago at home, which was actually a harmless snake, a little brown house snake. And I'm hoping we're gonna start seeing some more snakes as it moves, warms up. And wouldn't it be really exciting to see a massive African rock python? Now the biggest one I've actually seen before I get back in the car. Um, was in northern Zululand and it couldn't run away because it had swallowed a whole adult, adult warthog. So uh, it was quiet. So how's that? Can you see here, Brian? So there we go. Let's make that the line in the road. And one, two, three, four, five. Five meters is the biggest African rock python I've ever seen, which is longer than our safari vehicle. Isn't that incredible? And it was completely full and had a whole warthog inside it. Now, when you see pythons that are very, very full like that, you've actually got to be quite careful when viewing them because if you disturb them, they'll immediately spit out their meal. Now, a meal like a warthog can probably last that python for a couple of months. So you don't want them to get rid of their food. So you've got to be quite careful when you find a path python or any snake, in fact, that's heavily engorged. Okay, well, we're going to keep heading to the east. No sign of a Queen Karula just yet. Oh, very, very interesting. Uh, and Chris Rogue says she's quite sure that that spotted hyena was a member of the Elephant Plains clan. Now, could the reason that we saw that hyena all the way down here mean Oh, make a bit more sense why our clan is further to the north. Is that massive elephant cl plains clan pushing in on the Juma clan's territory? So the main reason I'm heading down towards a cheetah plains is that Brian and I have decided we haven't had a good cheetah sighting in, in, in months. And uh, the two male cheetah were seen in Torchwood yesterday, but their general direction was south, which is towards Cheetah Plains. So fingers crossed that the killer bees luck keeps going. So Michael says on the 
hyenas of the Juma Cheetah Plains in Arethusa Facebook page. There's a hyena that's seen with a blind right eye, not a left eye, and called Milky Way. Oh, now it's not that uncommon uh, for hyenas as they get older to have uh, or be blind in a single eye. One of the most ferocious, ferocious and fearsome hyenas I've ever seen in my life who was the matriarch of a clan of over 90 hyenas in northern Botswana was completely blind in her one eye and half blind in the other but she she was incredibly aggressive and uh, basically made well made a living made her meals uh, by following around our resident wild dog packs up there Okay, so we're going to keep heading towards the east and uh, while we do that, James has arrived at Buffelsook Waterhole in the area where those lions were calling this morning and were last night. Now we are going to just stop here and have a little bit of a listen and see if the lions have arrived or if they are somewhere around here. I don't see any. One always hopes to drive up onto the wall here and find lions. There goes a grey heron. Beautiful VM. Isn't that nice? That's fantastic. Shame, I wonder where he's going now that we've disturbed him. Probably to the Gallego uh, pan. Now, this is where our search for the little lion cubs begins. There apparently was some calling this morning. I didn't hear it myself. And so maybe those lions are around here. I haven't seen any tracks, but I... Oh, let's quickly go across to Brent. He's got something interesting. Well, not something we see too often, but we found a hippopotamus returning towards the Chitwa Chitwa Dam. And so jogging through the bush, the great grey behemoth. I'm just going to try to get us in a spot to have a good view. We're probably only going to get a back view. So we see hippo tracks regularly, but we don't often see them out of the water like this. Especially not in the daylight hours. And you see, see the, the hippopotami, Brian? Ah, jogging over there. Okay, let's just go a bit further forward. No, no gap. There's a gap there. There we go. So there is a large water hole uh, where that hippo is heading, jogging back to. Oh, there goes a, a big grey bottom. Oh, you're right. Well, nice little interlude on our way. Uh, a big, big hippo jog, jog, jogging. So I just need to be on the game drive radio for a second. Aubrey, Aubrey. So I just heard a report. Sorry, Aubrey, what was that report about Aubrey's right? Okay, copy. Thanks very much. Okay, so we're going to continue off uh, to the east and we're about to lose signals. We dip down into the Mulwanini River. So while we do that, uh, let's go back to James, who's in search for the incredible Incahumas. Now, I was just saying to you before, I was rudely interrupted by that hippopotamus that I could easily have missed the tracks going across Bivuzuk cut line because the light is very poor this morning, but I don't think I did. So we're hoping that that pride of lions is around where we are now. Viem Durenbrak will uh, get us into the sighting with any luck because he knows where they were yesterday and that will be the beginning of our search. That is of course unless they appear on the road in front of us, which would be very nice. I would like to see all c eight cubs together so that I might take some rank average photographs of them. Viem uh, very unkindly said to me this morning that you know, he refers to people with big camera lenses and as gunslingers. So Brent would be a gunslinger. There's a track. What's that? 
you can't see. No, just a sploosh. Just a sploosh. What is a sploosh? I don't think that's a word. That's hyenas. That's hyenas, okay. We are on the fine track here, everyone. An indefinable track. Right. Um, uh, so VM described me as a much more a musket loader than a gunslinger, which I thought was a, although rather unkind, possibly rather accurate. <laughs> yes. Hang on a second. The chances of them all being here again in the same place, being lions, unless, as VM says, they've murdered something very remote indeed. I think those are bushes. But there is a bird down there. You see the bird, VM? <laughs> Go to the right and you will see it. It's a white crowned shrike. What I'm looking at is not lions, I'm afraid. It is tawny coloured bushes. There's the white crown shrike, everyone. You can see the light not getting any brighter. This bank of cloud is a fairly thick blowing up over us. Anyway, I don't think it's going to bring any rain. White crown shrike would favour eating grasshoppers and things like that, but they're going to be in short supply this time of the year. Soon, however, with the burgeoning heat, they will start to come out. Oh, there's another really nice white crown shrike, Vimpy. With the colours, it is only in my adult life that I have started to appreciate the colours of this time of the year, the greys and the coppers. A little bit of green behind there from a silver cluster leaf. And mainly because of the way that it makes the colours of the animals stand out, well, some animals, and just the, uh, I think, the combination of the golden lions, for example, against the grey trees is just particularly attractive. When I was a kid, I used to find this a little bit harsh. But I'm not a kid anymore, am I, Viam? No, no, them days is over. Yes. Hello, David in Houston. You want to know about the Styx Cubs, eight of them that were left at Juma Dam. Yes, it's called Juma Dam in Cheetah Plains. Yes, two days ago. Uh, we went back to check there. The Cheetah Plains guys went to check as well, and they had moved off into a net. They were found into a net which is the reserve just to the west of that dam and they were left there again by the females. They went off hunting in Mala Mala. Uh, we are not allowed into that area so we couldn't really tell but they had been moved and they were found yesterday and they were still okay surprisingly. I think it's surprising having seen them in that very very open area on their own without any source of protection. So for those of you who don't know, we went across to Cheetah Plains two days ago, two days ago in the afternoon, and we saw those little cubs. Are we going the right way, Viam? I think it's that way. It's you think it's that way? This is Drakensberg. Because there are no tracks here. Um, and... <laughs> And we found them in the dam there. Five of them, the older ones, were on a very sort of uncomfortable looking termite mound. They were in the shade at least and they were hidden. But these three tiny little things that couldn't be more than, I don't know, maybe eight weeks old, were lying in the dry elephant footprints left at the bottom of the dam, completely in the open, vulnerable to anything from jackals to big birds of prey to hyenas to leopards, anything that had come across there, a buffalo, elephants, would have killed them. And I'm not sure why they were there, how they happened to be left there, it's rather a mystery to me. But the Inkahuma Pride children are looking much better. 
Now Brent has got some interesting tracks. I could not hear exactly what they were. I have no doubt they will be fascinating though. Go and have a look. So, after seeing no sign of snakes for many a month, we've now, within a couple of kilometers, got two very distinct, very different sets of snake tracks. Now, to guess which species this is, is very, very difficult. So, I knew the python. The python moves in a straight line. It doesn't sidewind. Now, this could be the other snake that moves in a straight line, the, the puff adder. But, from what I can see here, this looks like two snakes and it looks like they were mating. And you can see they were intertwined and they've literally all over the road. There's just tracks of these snakes as they've rolled and rolled and, and uh, produced the next litter. So, of course, the snakes will normally bury their eggs. And uh, who knows, maybe we're going to see some baby snakes along Gowrie Main at some point. But I was hoping that this would be quite fresh on top of the car I had just seen. But unfortunately, it doesn't seem to be that. They have been driven over already. But I am listening because mating snakes make a lot of noise. So I was almost hoping to hear the leaves going. But no such luck. I don't know if you heard that, Brian. A little bit. So that, I'm sure it sounds like that hippo we just saw arrived back at the water and let off a joyous, how would you describe a hippo call as harumph? A, a glorious harumph. <laughs> and it set off all the other hippos in the water to do the same. So python tracks, mating snake tracks. Maybe today is the day we see our first snake on drive for a long, long time. Okay, so we're still on our way towards Cheetah Plains. So far, I haven't heard any updates on the radio. So we've got this incredible canvas to work with. Well, a very good morning to Steve. Steve's says, how can you tell the difference between snake tracks and worm tracks? Well, firstly, Steve, we're not going to see any uh, worms at the moment uh, because it's so dry. And uh, the big worms we do get, we do get some worms that come out after the rain that are about this. They can get to about a meter long, but uh, they generally, we only find little muddy spots where they put breathing holes. But other than that, it's very, very seldom to see them on the, on the surface. And also, uh, their tracks will be much, much thinner than that. I mean, that was very wide. Those were actually quite, two quite big snakes that were mating there. And, uh, uh, well, worm tracks, a lot of the worms or caterpillars uh, we have here have feet. So we'll see little foot tracks like an inchworm. We'll actually only have a track here and then, whoop, whoop, uh, where there is a snake. You can actually, if you look very carefully, you can even see the individual scales sometimes on the tracks. So the two type of uh, snake tracks we find that go in a straight line that sort of move by this most incredible sort of muscle movement, uh, a, a mini constriction is a, so basically like that inchworm goes like this. Now, can you imagine that in a much larger scale with much thinner little muscles? So a python actually moves by just moving little muscles on its belly like this and that's how they move uh, if they're not disturbed and the same goes for a puff adder. All the other snakes we get out here use that side movement like we saw there. So using their muscles to propel themselves forward uh, in a different way. So generally when you see you see track the first track we saw this morning absolutely massive I mean a belly size of nearly the same width as this the same width as my hand. There's no other snake that's got a belly that big than the African rock python. Uh, with puff adder tracks, some t what you find is they've got a funny little tail. It's sort of like a little 
little rat's tail, a little tiny little very thin point at the end of a very fat body. So you have that little movement and then you have a little drag. It looks like it's dragging a stick behind it. And that's how the difference you tell, uh, but that's how you tell the difference between python tracks and puff adder tracks. When it comes to the other snakes, it can be quite difficult. Normally if you find a very big side winding track, uh, it's going to be the black mamba, which is the biggest of our other snakes we get here. And a black mamba can get to about four. The biggest one I've personally seen is over four meters. And about as thick as that. Massive snake. Now one must remember that most snakes are far more scared of you than you are of them. And most people who get bitten by snakes are playing with them or handling them. So as long as you use snake sticks and, and you're careful, you shouldn't ever be bitten by a snake. Now, we've had quite a lot of snakes at Inga's house where, where I live. I think we've had about 10 or 11 different species in the, the year or so that I've been living in that house. We've had uh, Mozambique spitting cobra, we've had snouted cobra, we've had shield cobra, uh, we've had puff adder, night adder, red-lipped herald, brown house snake, um, black-lipped centipede eater, and a, a, a variegated bush snake, uh, Schwieblin's blind burrowing snake, I don't know, I'm missing one or two. But yeah, so we had quite a few snakes there. And I think it's because we have such a high squirrel population and a lot of the snakes are trying to eat them. Fortunately, most of those snakes have been in the garden. Uh, only one or two, well, one, one joined, uh, joined us in bed, and that gave us a fright. And uh, that was a, a harmless snake, a little sand snake. And now Carrie's wondering, how would a python, how on earth would a python catch a warthog? Would it have to be dead already? No, uh, a python are quite, are quite good ambush predators, and they're incredibly strong. So it has to be a very, very big python to be able to catch a warthog. Um, they act as ambush predators. They'll often be close to uh, water holes or even sometimes in the water hole. And what will happen is they'll launch out and they've got recurved teeth, so hooked back facing teeth, very similar to sort of a moray eel or, or any of the eel species. And what they do is they latch on, get, get a purchase on an animal. They can eat adult impala as well. And then what they do is they use those incredibly strong muscles and they wrap themselves around and basically constrict, so crush uh, that animal to death. So boa constrictors, pythons, or py python is part of the boa family. All of them use constriction to kill their, kill their prey. Ooh, oh, hyena. Okay, so we're about to go through one of the little gremlin residences out here. Uh, so as we go behind the Cheetah Plains Lodge, we might have a little bit of signal breakup. It has been quite good recently. So we can stick with us for a bit longer, but we're about to arrive on Cheetah Plains. But I have some incredibly great news to share with you. Actually, I'm going to keep it as a surprise. I'm going to let James share his joy with you. <laughs> well, we found the lines, everybody. There they are, exactly the same position as they were yesterday. One female and three little babies. And uh, we've been driving around trying to get into a position where we can view them properly. And, um, uh, well, we're, they've now gone up and out of the drainage line. And we'll have to try and get around to the other side. But how wonderful. It's, I don't know where the rest of the pride is. They're not here. They're a big meal. Sure. They're on a big kill, says yeah, VM. I said she's, got a big meal. Oh, she's had a big meal. She's looking much fuller than she was yesterday. Okay, I think we're going to try and move now. I've just got to quickly call this in, everyone. Um, yeah, we're going to have to go around that way, everyone. I think we'll get a nice view from up the top there. Now, Brent has got no signal, so you're going to have to come with us, but that's okay. Stations located, one lioness and three cubs in the same position from yesterday. Um, zero out of five visual at this stage. That will now result in a major 
conflagration on the radio. Hold on, everyone. So it looks like the whole pride may well, as Viam has said, have caught something else. And we'll just try and get across. It's quite a drainage line, this. Are you all right there? <laughs> There's a very large stump that is very inconveniently placed here by the elephants. But Wendy, ever faithful Wendy, recalcitrant old bag most of the time, is doing a remarkably good job of getting us through this area. There we go. These are Combretum trees, everybody. Fear not, they will get up again once we've over the top of them. Cubs are still there playing on a log. If we had the super zoom camera, we'd probably just stop right here. Um, <laughs> We're not going to make it through this way, are we, Vim? No. Okay, we'll have to go around the other way. Sometimes I think a tractor or front-end loader would be better suited to what we do out here. A bulldozer. I suppose that might leave a bit of damage, though. So for those of you who are perhaps joining us for the first time or a little confused, this is the Inkuhuma Pride. These are the youngest additions to the Inkuhuma Pride, which consists of five lionesses and now and eight cubs. Three of them have got cubs. And we think that the other one, Amber Eyes, uh, certainly my favorite lioness in the Pride, uh, could well be mating at the moment. Well, certainly she has been in Estrus. And so there could be even more cubs fairly soon. I think eight is probably a good number for them to try and look after. I think any more than that, and they may end up in a situation like the Styx Pride, where there are just three females and eight cubs. And those cubs are, well, apart from the fact that they've definitely got some kind of fungal skin infection, um, they, they don't look like they have enough to eat. And that's not surprising. Eight cubs for three females to look after is a great number of cubs. Now this bush is a Gymnosporia buxifolia, fear not about it either, it is not endangered, and it will get up again. Well, some of it will, possibly not the entire bush. Where did we come through? There? Or over here? No, I think we came down there. There are the tracks. <laughs> this is uh, some driving, and then the smell in the air right now, let me describe that to you while we drive through here. Uh, I can smell now the a rather unkindly named bush, the Bushman's tea, or Bushman's grape, that's not unkind, but it does smell like it's Afrikaans name, Pardipus, which means horse's urine. You right there, Viem? Viem is still there, everybody. I know sometimes it seems like he isn't because he's so very silent. Hello James Richard, you want to know about the flower called Waltheria and whether it's got an English name. I haven't found an English name for it, James Richard, no. Which is strange because it is very common here and everything likes to eat it when it's in flower. But no, the Waltheria does not have an English name and I'm afraid I can't find one right now. I'm not going to concentrate too hard on finding one. Right, please excuse the noise everyone, that is the, uh, well that's one of the disadvantages of operating in a woodland rather than a grassland. Now I don't want to get too close to these little things and give them a fright. So we might go onto the road, you still see them Vim? they're the other side. Ah oh, there they are, they're right here. They're actually not far. We're going to go straight back out onto the road, everyone. They're right in there. That's great news. This is fantastic. Okay. I've been quite breathless after all of that driving. Hold on, everybody. That was a stick that shot miles into the air. <laughs> you know, I do, I'm quite sarcastic and complaining about these cars, but they really are quite impressive. 
So far, Dean, you say we need to get ready to squeal out loud for the cubs. I was banned from doing that because apparently I kept doing it too much. So I was banned by the directing team from squealing. I'm not allowed to squeal anymore. I just have to look at them and talk in a biologically flat tone. Right, they're just in the shade here. There they are. It's not the best view, but we'll just give you a quick view and then we'll try and go around them. There they are. <laughs> I need to try and get in there very quietly just because the little ones are slightly nervous when there's too much noise in the car. Mum doesn't care. She's used to us and that's well, that's why the cubs will grow up. So they'll stop being nervous very quickly. I do often wonder what on earth she thinks when these vehicles drive around her consistently. All right, let's wait here and see what happens. I think they'll probably come up and maybe start playing, or certainly coming to have a bit of a suckle shortly. So let's wait here, let them get used to us. They are, I can see two of them stalking each other through there. Um, you can't see that, can you? Hmm, a little bit hidden by the bushes. Let's wait here for a little while, everyone. I think it's going to be worthwhile to just let them settle slightly, let them move around a bit with our presence, and then we'll think about trying to move if they continue to play in that little section of bush there. Here we go. Look, 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 look. <laughs> Hello, Misha in Alabama. You're wondering about that little cub with the sort of gammy hip or gammy leg and whether it's recovered or not it seems to me if I'm not mistaken all the cubs were present yesterday and I'm gonna to have to ask for confirm confirmation from VM. VM is that true? Yes. All eight yesterday and all fine. Was the limp still there? Liam said he, at least VM says he doesn't notice any limp at all but they weren't very active so the fact that it's now what are we saying two and a bit weeks after that injury took place the cub is still alive, indicates to me that perhaps things are going to be all right. Listen. <laughs> and she's chewing something called a baboon's tail. She, I say. We know that what, there's at least one male here and one female. And I'm not sure what the others are at this stage. Thank you. A lovely a question from someone called Recalcitrant Old Bag in California. Um, Recalcitrant Old Bag, you want to know if the lions leave a babysitter when they go <laughs> when they go hunting. Um, I can't refer to you as Recalcitrant Old Bag. I mean, that would just be rude. Um, recalcitrant Old Bag, they don't, no. Uh, sometimes they do. Well, in fact, normally they don't. Like she, will, she will stash them in a thick bush, go off hunting and then come back and feed them with milk. But they're completely unlike, say, uh, wild dogs, which always leave a babysitter, or well, if the pack's big enough, they'll leave a babysitter. Um, in the case of that little pack of three that we've been seeing, for example, it's unlikely that they would leave a babysitter because they need all hands on deck, as it were. But lions don't do that. Uh, leopards obviously don't because they're solitary. And hyenas don't either. Sometimes hyenas will leave a nursemaid at the at the at the den site, but very often uh, the cubs just stay there on their own. Very sweet. Then it's not really bright enough for a man of my photography skills today. It'd be easy. And in the background. A lot more bird song today for some reason. The orange breasted bushrike. 
robins, doves, hornbills, franklins. And in front of us, little lions playing with baboon's tail. <laughs> ah, yes. I think if there was ever a debate about the leopard versus lion cubs, well, look at these things. James Richard, I think you're probably absolutely correct when you suggest that a lioness would be reticent about introducing her cubs to the pride if they were on a kill. Uh, yeah, and I think the reason for that, as I'm sure that you've guessed correctly, is that their blood is up, they are ready to fight, they fight each other tremendously over food, they don't share food with each other, and so yeah, I would say absolutely uh, a lioness would be very reticent to introduce her cubs to a pride uh, during the feeding time. They are too sweet, these things. <laughs> Isn't that sweet? Listen to the robin in the background. Oh, look. Managed to miss that one, Vim. <laughs> Let's look at the lions. No, you can't see my photographs, they're too ugly. This is fantastic. I don't wish to go anywhere. <laughs> Ali, you say... Well, I'm going to ask Louise to read that again. Your comment about the the cubs and what they're what they're saying to each other. Ah, grrr! I'm going to get you, tree. I'm a rough and tumble little lion cubby. Well, you are indeed. I'm just going to quickly get on the radio. Andrew, about a one out of five visual for two vehicles, but you can try and make your way in here. We're on Glory Pan Road. This is very, very special. And interesting, you know, yesterday that story of um, them being perhaps introduced for the first time to the Pride. Uh, I think that's a good interpretation from Brent uh, yesterday. But it's it's interesting. I wonder if it's uh, if it's a quick thing that happens, or if it happens over a period. So perhaps it wasn't the very first time they'd seen them, and perhaps it takes a bit of time for those lionesses to get used to the cubs, and for the rest of the Pride to start to tolerate them. So, I mean, you read that at six weeks they get introduced to the pride. I don't, it's obviously a process that takes place, as they're not staying with the other cubs at the moment. Sarah, you're wondering what that plant is that they're eating. It is something called baboon's tail, or zero fighter ready nervous. Now, yes, yeah, very nice. <laughs> Let's try and move a little bit, except this cub is now stalking us, Vim. Let's just wait one sec while the little one stalks us. Look. The other two have decided they're very hungry. And this one is stalking us. 
He has the look of a young prince, don't you think, Vim? Yes, he's probably a young princess. Except we know the lions, of course, are not real royalty. They're more kind of mafia royalty. He's very sweet. Hello, Marianne in Arkansas. You're wondering if I've ever tasted the baboon's tail, same as these uh, lions are doing. I have, Marianne. I've absolutely tasted a um, a baboon's tail. They taste like straw. Taste like nothing on earth. I don't think it's a good idea to eat the um, to eat the tubers, for example, or the leaves. I think they can be quite toxic. But the I have definitely tasted the sort of capillary strawy kind of protuberance that these chaps have been eating. It's not nice. Let's move slightly everybody. Can you see how the light is fading? I think VM's guess that the others, that the rest of the pride could be on a fairly large kill somewhere not too far away is, is a good one. There are no tracks going out of the reserve anywhere where we looked this morning. Now, what I want you to appreciate is that as we drive straight like this, they will see, obviously, the bull bars, and they see these two big headlights, and I wonder if they don't perceive them as eyes. And so, normally, you can get pretty close if you drive in sideways, but as soon as you start driving forwards towards animals, they tend to perceive it as slightly more of a threat. I'm just going to ease forward here. They will get used to us again. I'm going to watch Mum's behaviour very carefully. Watch out for this tree, everybody. There are no thorns on it. You right there, Vian? I'll just watch Mum carefully. Make sure she's happy with us. I'm going to talk a little bit more quietly. looks fine for now. But we want to make sure that we turn away from her now. And there we go. That's as far as I'm going to go, everyone. Perfect. That's much better. Isn't that sweet? Imagine that cannot be a particularly comfortable feeling for the mother, given that they've got little teeth now. They are lions, obviously, and therefore those teeth ain't going to be little blunt things. They'll be like little needles. Wonderful stuff. Justin, you're wondering about those spots on the lion's head and why they don't keep them as they get older. Well, try and think about what advantage it would give them now versus what advantage it would give them as adults. So there's their mum. You can see she's got no spots on her head. And the question is, why does she not have spots on her head? What possible advantage could having the spots confer on them? And the answer, Justin, I believe lies in the habitat in which they live as youngsters versus the habitat in which they live as older lions. They do not lurk in the thick bush as older lions. They are basically savanna animals and they will do they will do what they like. And they're very confident. But when they hunt, they hunt often in the long grass and they hunt yeah, they do hunt through thickets obviously. But as they hunt through thickets they cannot be completely hidden because they are so large and so they have that tawny color they hunt at night the youngsters a bit more like leopards live in thick bush they want to remain completely hidden from sight and they live in the da kind of dappled light of the drainage lines where there are thick bushes and shadows and that exactly like for a leopard is a great color to be you want to be that sort of spotted color that breaks up your outline and that's why they've got spots.
Isn't that sweet? <laughs> Too marvellous. Too marvellous. Young people, do you like me to sneak slightly forward, or are you okay here? Yeah? There is a big strict knot in the way. There is a big strict knot in the way, I'll depress the clutch and see if we don't roll forward. We won't. This is Wendy. How's that? No, no good. stop here. I don't, if we go any further forward, we're going to have to crush something It's going to make a noise. We're very close now. We've eased our way closer and closer. We're now about 10 meters from her. That's about 30 feet. Now obviously on foot she wouldn't tolerate us anywhere close to this distance. But in the vehicle we're just not perceived as a threat and you can see that by the fact that she's fast asleep well, as fast as asleep as she can be, with these little cubs having their morning milk. Right, let's head across to the far east at the moment. Uh, Brentley S. Smith is currently looking for a Singapore noodle stand in the far east. So we have decided to check an area that we don't check too often. Uh, the killer bees are feeling lucky and this is the area that there's a female leopard we haven't seen on Safari Live before does come into. And we had some female leopard tracks and they seem to head whoopsie, uh, this way so we're just going very very slowly. What I'm really hoping to find is a lovely drag mark where she might have caught something, dragged it across the road so we can find her sitting in a tree. Uh, apart from that, this is always a good part of the world to look for Mr. Q, quarantine male leopard. Uh, we found him in this area a few times. And the wonderful thing about being in the bush is you never know what might suddenly appear. Now, I was hoping for some reptiles, some snakes, because it was quite a warm morning. The temperatures actually dropped, but there is a beast. Now, is it just a group of Duggar boys? Or is there a herd here? I think it's just a group of old boys. That gives us a chance to use our ears. So just a quick update for what's happening around. Sticks Pride have been frowned, unfortunately, off our traverse area. There's two Birmingham's also just off our traverse area and no sign of the cheetahs yet. So hopefully the cheetahs are waiting for us to head towards the open areas to make an appearance. Well, a very, very good morning to Liz. Liz says, are we going to continue uh, the game we started playing on yesterday's Sunset Safari? And it's when I... We will definitely, Liz. So just for those of you who aren't playing, at some point during this morning's Sunrise Safari, I'm going to tell you guys to start tweeting or start emailing. Uh, as soon as we get five emails or five tweets saying, stop, uh, I have to stop. It doesn't matter where we are. And... Uh, give 10 interesting facts with, within an area around the vehicle. So I will mention it. I think I'm going to keep tracking for the next little while, but a little bit later on the safari, we will definitely instill. But quickly across to James. Everybody, these lions are basically stalking us now. The mother watching carefully. I'm speaking very quietly. You can only see two of them. Oh, there they are, all three of them there. They're looking at Vian. They came walking up to us. They're now less than three feet from the vehicle. I can't even see. I can only see them through the camera lens. They are so close to us, I cannot see them through the over the passenger door. 
She seems to be very relaxed about the situation. But I don't want to incur her wrath at this stage, obviously. But they've taken upon taken upon taken it upon themselves to come this close to us. And we can see, oh this is just amazing. It's unbelievable. They're bigger than house cats now. You can see that very clearly now. And what I would like you to take note of is that I said the other day, somebody asked why don't they approach vehicles like hyena cubs? I said, well, I don't really know. Leopard cubs don't because leopard adults don't and leopards aren't as confident. But these chaps have done precisely what I said I didn't know if they would. And they're right close to us now. They've approached us, stalked us. The little, other little one is now out in front. They've lost interest slightly. The mother is watching us very carefully. So I'm speaking quietly. And VM is making very slow moves on the back with the camera. Nothing sudden about anything we're doing here. We must never forget that things can go, or situations can change extremely fast out here as soon as you start to get complacent about any of this stuff. Greg, what a lovely question from you while we talk very quietly in this situation. You say, are the vehicles likely to be perceived as another grazing animal by these cats um, or, or as opposed to a sort of bipedal threat? I think one half of that is correct. They don't see us as a bipedal threat, that is clear, because they wouldn't let us get anywhere near as close as this if they're on foot and they wouldn't approach us if we were on foot. That said, this car doesn't smell like a grazer, it doesn't eat, it comes and, and sits next to them. A grazer, they would be, you know, a big grazer like a rhino or an elephant they would move away from. A small grazer they would eat if it came this close to them. So it's somewhere in between. They don't see us as a threat, they don't see us as something to eat and it's quite an interesting situation that I'm not sure anyone has very clearly understood and what's very interesting is at least so let's just try and sex them while they're sitting out there like that one male one female there those two now it's just the other one we don't know Greg what happens or as a friend of mine said to me once he says a lion can spot a monkey's ear behind a tree at a hundred meters how on earth can we think that they don't recognize what we are sitting on the back of these cars? And I think that's a very good point. It's just the fact that they don't perceive us in the same way. They just don't perceive us as a threat. And that is because I think we're not standing up. It's also because our human scent is to some extent masked by the brake fluid and the transmission fluid and the steering fluid and the engine oil and the gas or petroleum that we're burning in the car uh, so I think to some extent that's one of the reasons they don't um, perceive us in the same way right that's a little lioness there who's got the oh no that's the little lioness there hello cluster charge you're a new viewer and you say, what do we call these cubs when they're older? Um, I'm not really sure how to answer your question. I think maybe you're asking um, what do we call them? Uh, yearlings, juveniles, maybe, when they're not cubs? Uh, in terms of a name, they probably won't get names because they're part of the pride. Okay, there we can see very clearly two lionesses. Two lionesses, everybody, one male. So we've got one male and two lionesses. That's quite interesting. Very, very sweet. So cluster charge, if I'm not answering your question correctly, please just send us through another one. And also, ask us, or tell us where you're from. 
be lovely to know where you're from. And thank you for watching and thanks for asking a question. So as far as I could tell everybody, two little females, one little male. And you can actually see quite easily when they lift their tails. Very distinct swelling on the male and obviously not with the females. Well, they will be otherwise completely indistinguishable until they're about, well, I don't know, one and a half to two years old. They're so fluffy. And I know some of our younger viewers have asked what it would be like to pick one up and feel them. And I can see the temptation. But there's just been a whole great furore on social media again about cub petting and how it's not a good thing for these lions and how if ever your kids have the chance to go to a petting zoo and pet lion cubs or some people bring lion cubs around to schools it's an appalling thing for conservation the lions when they grow up they turn into very large very impossible to manage creatures and you know that can only bring about one of two fates neither of which I wish to go into now. So please, although they look so fluffy and they look so sweet, should you ever have an opportunity to uh, suggest to people who have petted them that it isn't a good idea, well, please do that. Marga, I think that your postulation is a good one. Whether it's true or not, I don't know. You're in the Netherlands and you say you wonder if they didn't move away from the pride, that this female didn't move away from the pride in order, to, um, in order to give them the best chance of having milk. Because, of course, we know that lions cross suckle and so there's a good chance that the cubs and the other litters would try and feed from her. Yeah, I think that's well possible. These ones are probably two weeks younger than the youngest ones of the other five. And so I think it's certainly possible that she would have done that. And that's why I was talking about this process of introducing them to the pride. I think it's, it is a process. It's not a, a, a once-off sort of thing. But immediately, I mean, these little things we've watched from when they were probably a week old. We saw them for the first time just north of Bifelshoek Dam there. Uh, in a drainage line and they were immobile, their eyes had just opened. It's been remarkable to watch them grow now. I think we probably think they're about five weeks old now. Listen to them now. And their mum very relaxed, which is fantastic. I'm just, uh, you can probably hear my voice starting to lift slightly. As her cubs are no longer underneath the car. It's a good thing, don't you think, Vian? Yep. Can't see them underneath the car. Can't see them underneath the car, no. Well, she spotted or heard something. She's up. And although they look relaxed, these lionesses are so aware all the time. This is just fantastic. I might sit here all day and never leave. Is that okay, Vian? Yes. <laughs> Hello, Justin. Sorry, a game drive radio communication came. As your question was asked, Weezy, can you go again with Justin's question, please? Oh, Justin, I think there's a very good answer for, um, although I've never read this, uh, I think there's a very good answer for your question. How is it that the cubs have got so much energy when clearly the adults do not? And Justin, I think the answer lies in the fat that they eat. They eat a huge amount of fat, obviously, um, in their mother's milk. 
milk or mammal milk is full of fat that is very good for burning for energy as I think you'll find that's why they have so much more energy than the adults who have almost no fat in the diet and therefore have to create energy from protein which is an extremely expensive metabolic process. That makes sense? Louise of course is a biochemist if I'm not mistaken of, by trade or molecular biologist. What was it Louise? She'd probably be able to tell you more about that the chemistry and physics of it. <laughs> yeah, she's a biochemist. Quite nice having a biochemist as a director. <laughs> and ca coming from the biologist who's directing the show, she says she also reckons because it's liquid, it's probably di quicker to digest. I think that's a very good postulation as well. Thank you, Louise. <laughs> good job. I'll ask you more. From now on, feel free to answer Justin's questions the next time they come through. We've got a couple of engineers in camp, everyone. We've got biochemists, we've got uh, what else have we got? IT people plenty of clowns plenty of clowns, I think we've probably got the greatest number of clowns outside of the professional circus And can you hear in the background there the brown hooded kingfisher can you see him? Yeah. He's very close by. There he is. And Durban Driver, you say you love here the brown hooded kingfisher. Well, Durban Driver, I'm not surprised because the brown hooded kingfisher, of course, is quite familiar to you in Durban. It lives there. Brilliant. See my picture later, Bim. Not now. In the exposure. <laughs> that was a sardonic comment from Vim saying, I'm just setting the exposure. Much more bird song this morning than I've heard for the last little while. Also simitable <whistles> in the background. Such a lovely subtle whistle. Okay, while we are watching these little cubs having a bit of a relax, let's go and find out how the great cheetah finding expedition is faring in the Far East. It's not faring very well. That tracks that female leopard went into Mala Mala. So we've left that area. We're now making our way towards the cheetah plains pan and we're hoping to find anything. We have not even seen an impala this morning, uh, but it is quite pleasant down here on Cheetah Plains. There's mist rolling above us, and we've had some nice views of the sun through the mist. Now the mist has got too thick to even see the sun, but it does look like it might dissipate soon. And I am, of course, Oh, elephants. Always an optimist. So even if there's absolutely nothing, we will find something. And I think it's a good time to really test the bush knowledge. So from now, let's see how many stops we can get on Twitter or email. And when we get five in, we will stop and have to show you 10 things We're around the vehicle. So there we go. Off you guys go. Hashtag Safari Live or questions at wildearth.tv. And hopefully, when I stop, I stop and Mr. Quarantine pops his head over a termite mark. He's 10 interesting things all by himself. Okay, 
Okay, so as we say, it's been a bit a bit quiet on cheetah plains. Aha, but it is not quiet now. Ah, Safari Dean is sending a quiz to me. In what part of Africa do lions scavenge 50% of their food from hyenas? Well, I actually talked about that this morning, Safari Dean. Mm -hmm. And there's actually more than one place. And uh, it is the Serengeti and Masai Mara ecosystem where the lions scavenge 50% of their food from hyenas. But also uh, in certain parts of northern Botswana. But we have a massive herd of elephants. So I, I know there's five tweets telling me to stop. We're going to have to do it again because it quite, might be quite detrimental to my health if I got out of the car here. Hello, guys. Now, this is an incredibly large herd of elephants and there's some to the right of us here. Some nice naughty little ones and then there's probably another 25 or 30 that I can see off to the other side of the road. Let me just move forward a little bit. Hello, Ellie's. Now, if I keep quiet and we listen, you can actually hear how many elephants are around us. And they just keep, seem to keep more and more appearing. With some little ones. Particularly big old cows as well. And these two, well that female in particular there, she's very big. These ladies are not looking in too bad a condition considering the circumstance at the moment. What are you doing little monster? Jason saying, and he's noticed a, a decline in the elephant health over the last month and is really hoping the rain comes early on September 8th. Now, Jason, that would be quite nice. Unfortunately, I don't share your optimism there. I think we're only going to get rain deep into October. Oh no, November, sorry. Okay, let's just move forward a little bit. Hello. Now, due to this a drought we, we're having at the moment is, is why some of the elephants are losing condition. So far, these ellies around us don't look too bad. Now, look at that. Moving the dead branch to get to the other branches. Now that is a low fault milkberry, which is not something we see elephants feed on too often. Oh, <laughs> definitely a little boy. <laughs> it's, it's so funny because it's, it's I, I know we know it's going to happen a lot of the time, but I just, I just can't help. It gives me such a feeling of immense joy when a little elephant bull decides to uh, show us how tough he is. There, there we go. Now head turn, give us a sniff, make sure there's a bush between, stay close to mom. 
<laughs> and he's sniffing around in a little depression there that elephants would have dug out uh, during wetter months and probably would have, it would have definitely held water but the reason these ellies look to have dug here it could be there's some <laughs> I'm gonna throw I'm gonna throw throw stuff at us now one more time for just for fun no looks like he's actually eating some of the soil and uh, there's probably nice uh, mineral content in that soil but we're going to sit here with this wonderful big herd of eddies uh, but james has got lions on the move Ow! now the last time the three of them came close the mother is now standing right next to us and every time i speak she looks this way She's calling the others now because it, it walked right underneath the car. We can't move right now. We am just sit very still because we've kind of now split them. Well, we haven't. They've split each other. So we're going to sit very still. That little one is now trying to find mum. move now if you want. There they are behind us. <laughs> I have to tell you I feel some sense of relief that they're all behind us now, all reunited certainly. Very, still very close to us and I cannot move the car I'm afraid so the picture is not going to be great <laughs> they are she is about three feet from the back tire and the cubs are now all with her obviously and looking at us and proving again that a little bit like hyenas they are rather fascinated by the presence of a vehicle. And, uh, 
was nice. We're going to um, obviously not move everyone, so we're going to sit right here until <laughs> until they move. I mean, we're very comfortable here now. I'm just not sure how good your view is. And we'll see what they do. <laughs> you can hear them calling at each other. Ow! All right, we're going to sit here. We're not going to go anywhere. Um, we're going to go back across to Brent and the elephants at Cheetah Plains and we'll keep you posted. So, we've actually become almost immersed in the elephant herd as they've moved through the bush towards us. And uh, while I've been watching, I've noticed them feeding on one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight different, oh, sorry, I'm looking at all the trees they're feeding on and we're being shown who's boss, but from a safe distance. So eight different species, and that's without looking too carefully. So they're, they're diet has become much broader because of the drought and they are eating stuff that sometimes they wouldn't normally eat and they are slowly making their way down towards the cheetah plains pan so i'm hoping they're going to go there for a drink a little later but they are moving very slowly and feeding as they go so they don't have quite have the water walk yet so we could count 21 elephants, but there's a few we missed. And they just seem to keep coming out of the bush. And this little one is feeding off a sickle bush. Or sometimes known in the safari world as the flat tire tree. Now, quite unusually, you can see the sickle bush is very, very green. And that's because of where it is. It's on a seep line. And it's tapping into the underground water. It's one of the few very green sickle bushes we're going to see at the moment. Now, Lady Alone Wolf says, Do I believe that elephants bring good luck? Well, that's an interesting one. Brian, do you believe elephants bring good luck? Yeah, I, I like elephants. They make me happy, so therefore that's good luck. So yes, I agree. Elephants bring good luck. Just because of the way they often make you feel when you spend a lot of time with them. Now, whether they bring good cheetah luck is another discussion altogether. We hope so. Let's just leave it at that. So you can see that little one's little tushes are, are coming out. So it's just over a year old. It's generally the first time you start seeing those little tusks. Helena. Uh, Helena is wondering if any of the rangers or guides, so I assume you're referring to us, Helena, have ever seen a live elephant birth. I've been lucky enough, I've seen uh, four or five different live elephant births. Uh, never since I've been at Safari Live. Oh, look at that. It's so pink inside it, in, inside her little mouth. Really enjoying that sickle bush. But no longer, time to move on. Oh, 
Here comes trouble, Brian. There's a, a little gang of young bulls, little, and quite, not quite teenagers, pre-teens, that seem to be full of the joy of life on this cool morning, chasing each other about through the terminalia or silver cluster leaf woodland. Let's just move a little bit further forward. really see them too well through there but if you look here this little female slightly older about seven or eight years old getting really stuck into the sickle bush quite nice to see a bit of green mm, lovely I hope you guys are getting some screenshots of these incredible ellies. Hello, little madam. Hungry girl. Oh, there's tree species number 10 that I've seen them feeding off. That is a low felt albizia again is not a common food source for elephants but with this drought they've definitely extended their diet disappearing into the weeping wattle uh, angels wondering how much water does an elephant need to drink each day um, a big elephant bull angel will oh good break well I'm going to carry it with us I will drink up to 120 liters about 200 I don't know, I'm, I can't remember gallons now <laughs> and 30 odd gallons of water a day for a big elephant bull and females and smaller elephants a bit less now, they don't need to drink every day, but if there was water available, they will drink every day. Now, some of these front-running elephants are starting to make their way down towards the first of the large open areas. And I just want to go have a quick look there, in case there are a cheetah about. Uh, or it might be really fantastic to catch them as they come out of the thickets into the open. Hello, little one. Although this little Ellie is so close, we can't, we cannot pass that. Oh, <laughs> chew that. Now that Ellie is probably about seven foot from us, completely taking no regard of us while removing the bark from the weeping wattle. Yeah. Crunching as she turns that branch in her mouth to remove the bark. Got it? Yum. You can see how incredibly dexterous they are with their trunk. Now she's choosing that specific piece that she's loosened with her teeth. See that 
prehensile, those two prehensile tips on her trunk that basically operate like a hand. who's 18, says, what's wrong with the skin on her head? It seems discolored. Well, if we have a closer look there, um, you can see there is some discoloration there, and that's from putting your head in bushes. So it's just transference or rub off from whatever she's been feeding off. Um, looks like she might have scratched her head against one of the terminalias. It's got a bit of lichen on it, and that's the discoloration. So there's nothing wrong whatsoever. She's just got some vegetation discoloration on her forehead. <laughs> yeah. It's incredible to just sit quietly with elephants and just watch those minute little movements if we look at their trunk a bit more carefully and that constantina effect it has just it's, i always find it fascinating when you close the elephants to watch it carefully as those wrinkles get bigger or smaller and they maneuver it around Throw the branch at you, Brian. Now, if she is now about four foot from Brian, here's the thumb. Isn't this just amazing? Isn't it so special that she feels absolutely no threat from us whatsoever? Yeah. Off she goes, she's finished with her branch. It seems like the animals like being close to the vehicle today, both the lions and the elephant. So, Dean is wondering why don't they eat the leaves of the weeping wattle? Oh, yes, sorry, snorted me. Um, well, Dina, at this time of the year, there's almost zero nutrients in those leaves, so all the nutrients are going to be in that bark. And particularly on the, the sort of younger, younger, younger branches, that the tree is putting more effort to pump nutrients into, so they can grow more. And also, oh, with most elephants, mostly uh, eat less leaves than than than, than the actual bark and so, itself from the tree. So there's far more nutrients, uh, and for the amount of effort it would take to to eat the same amount of nutrients and uh, from the leaves they'd probably have to eat oh, 10 times the weight of what they have to do and bark and obviously 10 times the effort and with elephants only really digesting about 60 percent of what they eat and feeding for the majority of the 20, 20 24 hours uh, if they had to focus on the leaves it, it just wouldn't be nutritionally beneficial to them so I said, we're going to leave those ellies. They're slowly moving their way down towards the Cheetah Plans water hole. I think they're probably going to get there in about 20 minutes or, or so, 25 minutes. So we're going to head now and see if those cheetah have possibly crossed uh, down around the big open areas. Okay. So, elephants bring good luck. Let's see if they bring us good cheetah luck. They definitely bring us bad road luck. And uh, they tend to like to make us reorganize our routes. As you can see, there we go, a tree across the road. And an elephant is definitely the culprit. But fortunately, there's a spot we can just squeeze around. about um, less than a minute from arriving at the first massive open area so 
fingers crossed that there's going to be something other than normal Norman, the wildebeest, Gnormus Gnormans arch enemy who lives on these northern plains, the cheetah plains. Of course, Gnormus Gnorman lives in the south, but while we go see what's happening out in the big open areas, James has got those lions on the move again. Well, they're not moving, everyone, and uh, the reason you haven't seen us for a while is that we couldn't move. We simply were unable to move. Then she moved a little bit away. I tried to move backwards, made a horrible scraping sound against this false thorn tree that is on the left-hand side of your picture. She then sat up again and eyed Vian as if to say, you're making a noise. And so we then did a maneuver and we turned around basically where they were lying before. And here we are. I have to tell you, that was quite an experience having her so close. I've been that close to lions many, many times, but with the cubs, there's always just that little sense that things are slightly unpredictable. And you don't get, you know, <laughs> with lions, at least with leopards and hyenas, and their cubs approach, especially the hyenas, you know, the parents don't mind in the slightest. But you always slightly confused as to, or slightly unsure as to when she's going to start blaming you for the fact that her cubs are crawling underneath the car. <laughs> That's wonderful. Yeah, Sandy, it's a very valid question. You say, do, uh, am I not slightly worried being so close to them? Let's see where she takes them now. Uh, given that, you know, what happens if another animal came past here and we were in the middle of them, would that not be a problem? It certainly can be, Sandy. And that's why we watch carefully all the time. And I mean, Herbert was telling me the story the other day of when he was a tracker and he had a young ranger come in from town and got into the middle of a lion hunt. Uh, they were hunting some Nyala. He said, get out of here, and she didn't listen. And they had a horrible experience where the lions caught the Nyala, but right next to the vehicle. And when their blood's up like that, it can be a problem. It can be quite nerve-wracking. And it can, they can suddenly see you. I mean, it's highly unlikely, but it's possible that they will then see you as a threat. And it's, yeah, I mean, you've got to be careful. It's highly unlikely they're ever going to jump onto the vehicle, but it's not completely out of the realms of possibility. And let's see where she takes them now. We're definitely going to give her a bit of space as she moves with them. Isn't that sweet? Look how perfectly coloured they are now. And she's talking to them all the time. She keeps going, ooh, 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 ooh. Now, on Torchwood, which is not far from here at all, there are six lionesses and a male lion eating a buffalo. Who, how, where, goodness knows. Because it's right at the overlap. I think it's probably what we call the Torchwood Pride, uh, but I think they, spend, they definitely spend most of their time in the Kruger, east of us. But they've killed a buffalo there, and it would be interesting to know then where. When I first heard there was a dead buffalo, I assumed it must have been the rest of this pride. But clearly it isn't. And so she will be aware, probably, of it. She would have heard the commotion last night. The others may have gone to check it out. Look. You kind of forget, you know, when I mean, you don't have the cubs for a long time. We, we've had leopard cubs and lion cubs now for the last, I don't know, couple of months. And you forget what a tremendous privilege this is and how it doesn't happen all the time. And as I say that, a bit of moisture is starting to drip from the sky. Be interested to know what the weather report is like on Cheetah Plains, which is slightly sort of uh, further along where this weather is coming from. Just going to call this in on the radio. It's 
stations. This lioness and her cubs have now come out of the thick bush and they're mobile towards Bovosok Dam or towards towards Hippo Pools Road from Gwari Pan. Anna Marie, you've got a comment. It's coming through now from Wisi. You say the habituation process is fantastic. It is, but it's, you know, with lions, it's so much about the mother. That it's much more about the mother than it is about us. It's about her habituating them to us rather than the other way around. Last station, who are you calling? Uh, Duncan, it's James. Uh, as far as I'm aware, there are only eight cubs in this pride. Three, two, and three. Does that make sense? There we are. No, they're definitely two litters, uh, one of three, one of two, and then this new one of three. I think I'm 99.9% .9 sure that's what the, this case is. Okay, Cuppy, no, we're with them now, they're all fine. And he's just concerned they did only saw two of them uh, yesterday, and they were a bit worried about them. This is a chap from uh, Buffles Hook. Um, they've stopped now, they're in the block between Hippo Pools and Gwari Pan. Copy that, I'll give you last position. So, I don't know what she's doing here. I'm not sure why she would have moved out of that thick stuff. Perhaps the rest of the pride is not far from here. It wouldn't surprise me. We're just having lots of talk on the radio at the moment, everyone. Look at that. Playing on a termite mound. Termite mound, an ideal little spot for playing. And you can see their little things, they're, they're entertained by whatever is unusual, and that's why they approached us earlier. Sarah of Washington, a really nice question from you about whether or not the fact that they're so relaxed about us puts them at a higher risk from poachers. Um, first of all, lion poaching is not a huge activity. Um, because it's very difficult to, sorry, one second. Orbs, there's a lion, li there's a pride of six on a buffalo in Torchwood, somewhere around Second Rock, uh, if I'm in charge there. He's three from uh, Gwari Pan Mobile now towards Hippo Pools Road. Um, sorry, Sarah, I just wanted to get rid of that quickly so that I could talk to you properly. I don't believe, yeah, I'll go for it, come Gwari Pan. I don't believe that it does put them under any danger, further danger from poachers. I'll tell you why. Poaching of lions does occur, but it's normally done with snares. So it's normally done for body parts. It's not done for, um, it's not done for commercial sale to sort of overseas markets like it would be for rhino. Yes, there probably is a market for lion parts. It doesn't seem to be a big thing at the moment. Um, were a poacher to come into the area in a vehicle like this, then I suppose it could m much more easily kill a lion. Poachers don't operate like that though. They come in on foot because they cannot come in in a vehicle like this. It's impossible for them to get cars like this in. On foot, absolutely not. There is nothing habituated about this lioness to our presence on foot. And so no, I don't believe that we have any effect on that at all. <laughs> I love the sound they make. Yeah, <laughs> we're right there. Okay. <laughs> 
Hello, Ali. You say this mama lion is so proud of her cubs. Yes, I would agree with that. And then there was a question that came. I'm afraid I missed it because Vian was having a consumptive cough. Um, what was well, sneeze? Oh, is this her first letter? You would call it a letter, Ali. Absolutely. You say, but you say, is this her first letter? I think it probably is. Yeah, I think she's the young lioness. Maybe not the young guest, but you can see she's a fully pink nose, which means she's, she's probably only about three and a half. So I would think this is probably her first litter. Now they seem to be approaching us again, which is rather amusing. We're in much more open area now, though, so they can move away. He was sorry one sec Michael this is fascinating information just keep coming on Gwari Pan orbs you'll get us visual um, Michael you say at one stage before the Mapocho arrived the Sinkuhuma pride consisted of if I've got your numbers correctly 15 lionesses and 21 cubs is that correct 13 lionesses and 21 cubs and then the Mapocho males arrived and they were a, a vicious bunch of males that came in here didn't last long actually lasted about maybe two years it was five to start with and they killed a lot of lions around here they created a massive massive upheaval and I don't know what they decimated this pride to, but they decimated many prides around the Sabi sand before they were eventually tossed out by the Majingelan coalition, who still operates. They've been quite long-lived. They operate there in the south and the west of the reserve. That's fascinating. Thank you, Michael. That really is interesting history. I didn't know that. I knew I was at Londolozi when the Mapocho came in here and they were, yeah, I mean, we just every day we'd hear a report from somewhere all the way, Ulusaba, all the way to the west, up here at Juma, to the north, Mala Mala to the south, those five lions raged through this area. They killed many lionesses and obviously every cub they found. I think that's the little male walking off there. He's quite a stocky little fellow. <laughs> this is just brilliant. Now, good question from Megan in Texas. You say, will the male cub become part of the Birmingham coalition? Not at all. No, he will be, he will be excommunicated by his father. He will be thrown out of the pride as soon as he turns about two and a half years old. As soon as he's basically when he hits puberty and his testosterone levels start to rise. And as his testosterone levels start to rise, so he will then try and mate with the other females in the pride and that his father and uncles will not tolerate and they'll toss him out that's assuming he gets that far it's not it's by no means guaranteed what was that a female just wrestled him off says says vm good point i'm just going to move forward so that aubrey can get in here There's a lot of strychnos here, a very thick, nasty bush, but at least it's open, so she can move away. Unlike when in that other position, it's a little bit more difficult for her to move away from us. Horrid noise. A 
And Angel, you say how long before this lioness and her cubs decide to stay with the pride permanently? Uh, Angel, I think we're a matter of days, maybe a week or two before that happens. She's being so tolerant of us making all this noise, everyone. Say when, VMP. Is that right? Oh, and they are loving this vehicle. And listen to them, just listen to them. <laughs> it's my best sound. So cross. <coughs> Sounds like a house cat. No, don't come up here now. No, no, no. Okay, everyone sit still. They're now very, very close again. This is not really what I wanted. sit very still. They've gone around the other side of us. No, now in front of us. She, she doesn't like it when they get that close. They're just a few meters away. So close I can't even get them in my camera from lens. There she goes. <laughs> Isn't this amazing? There's the last one. <laughs> oh, wee. That's just brilliant, brilliant stuff. Shall we carry on, Vim? I think while we get through this rather thick strychnos patch, let's find out how Cheetah Plains is going with BLS. Well, I was about to say there is very almost nothing around us, but at that very moment, I spotted a female kudu. Actually, and you might be able to hear a helicopter off in the background. It is a Kruger National Park anti poaching chopper just flying the boundary. They do do regular patrols because, quite often, with poaching, presence is half the battle. And she's listening intently to that helicopter. Or is she listening to me? Hmm. Oh, very graceful, beautiful antelope. You can hear quite a... Oh, I suppose we've still got a helicopter, so we'll listen when the helicopter's gone. There are quite a bit of few birds around. And uh, what I'm going to do, guys, I'm going to give you the opportunity to use the stop again, because I'm hopefully not going to bump into any elephants or anything. So. Hashtag Safari Live with the word stop and I will stop wherever I am and show you 10 interesting things around the vehicle. But we are, I was hoping those elephants might move through towards the Cheetah Plains pan for a drink. It doesn't look like they have, it looks like they've moved further north. But we are checking, no one's been on this road yet this morning. But I was hoping there would be some sign of those two male cheetah. But alas, no such joy. Hi, Chitra in India. Now, Chitra's talking about something that was actually quite a big problem in India. 
and is, is there cattle or uh, encroachment from the surrounding communities into the park? Uh, no, not really. The, the park's been here and a lot of the reserves have been here for a very long time and uh, so on this western side that borders a lot of the local communities there is a, a very big, very impressive electrified fence and that keeps the cows out but it's more to keep the lions in but occasionally we do have lions escape out and uh, eat the odd cow and that is actually a, a bigger problem than the cows coming into the reserve so we don't really have cattle encroachment in this area other parts of Africa uh, where it's not fenced there is cattle encroachment but a lot of the truly wild parts of Africa have one of the best defenses against cattle encroachment in the world and one would often actually that's it it's a quiz for you guys what is the best defense against domestic livestock encroachment in the majority of Africa what keeps them out uh, if you know the answer to that use the hashtag safari live on Twitter and let me know or uh, you can use the email address questions at wildearth.tv so I think it's been quite quiet down here on Cheetah Plains. We're going to start moving north slightly, but remember five stops on email or on Twitter and we'll stop and I will be forced to show you. Oh, we have reached the five stops. You guys seem to keep making me stop in the more difficult spots. Okay, what do we need for this, Brian? We need a knife. And indeed we do. Just in case. There's my knife. Okay, 10 interesting facts around the vehicle. Now, in case the lions do something interesting, I'm just going to let Brian know if I must link. So, Brian, if Lou tells me, I will send you back across to the cubs. Aha! Number one. We'll leave that there for now. Let's see what else we can find. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Well, see, we can't do that because we did that yesterday. Oh, this is going to get tricky after a while. Dun, 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 dun. Okay, let's have a look. Number two. Haha, and I'm not going to let you see what's inside. What else can we find? Aha, that's why I needed the knife. Number three. Oh dear. Number four. And five, actually. Oh, there's no bones around here. Okay. Well, let's do the first five. And six. Oh dear, did it blow away? Oh dear. What do I stop? Yeah. Okay, we're going to start with the one I'm going to put back first. <laughs> the termites ate the whole inside. Now I've made a mess in the car. Oh, that's okay. You see that there in there, Brian? Right in there? So we've got a pair of actually not a pair so it looks like this is a violin spider a female and just behind her can you see a slightly pale paler looking spider now that looks to be the male <laughs> and he's be expired so it looks like the female has actually eaten him now that is not uncommon in spiders so after mating uh, if the male can't sneak away quickly they often get eaten by the females. They're very, very cool. This is the most venomous spider 
we one of the most venomous spiders but they are very shy and retiring and they've got very small mouth parts so you really have to really have to try hard to be bitten and this is the wonderful thing now that's number one number two is in here as well you see you see that little pale thing there now there's another spider it looks like a type of jumping spider or crab spider that has been caught by the violent spider and eaten and the most amazing thing when you start looking a little bit closer you start seeing other things so that's one two now number three Now, I didn't see that initially. There's a little stick insects. Very, very cool. So I didn't see that. A little stick insect. And uh, probably trying to avoid being eaten at the moment, so that's why crawling under a log. But normally when they're out mating, they actually do have wings, but we can't really see them in there now. So they are able to fly it between different spots. Okay, let's put the spiders and the stick insects back where we found them oh dear they keep blowing away it's fine I'll find some more now I oh know there's some there now this is number four and number five isn't that an absolutely fantastic color uh, it almost looks like it's rusted and uh, that's uh, color russet and it's a russet bush willow now the main thing i want to chat about here is two things firstly why they keep blowing away they designed to blow away that's how the seeds are dispersed now let's see if no, i don't think there's enough wind to catch it now you see basically working like a sail oh the wind's picking up on on cue let's see if the others are are better suited to rolling. That one looks like it's been a bit damaged. Doesn't have the nice wheels yet. So they're actually designed to catch the wind and on strong windy days they can roll for a couple of hundred meters away from where they have been spawned. Now the more interesting thing about this specifically because we're in a drought and what number are we are this is five there eh? and, and specifically because we're in a drought is uh, the Herero people who are indigenous to Botswana and Namibia and they're great cattle men and it's it's a very dry part of Africa so drought is not uncommon up there and these particular seeds are one of the lifesavers to those cattle men and they are collected and if I have a even if I look on the ground here I can see a whole bunch so the little herd boys are actually sent out to collect and specifically russet bush willow seeds they seem to be far more nutri nutritious uh, than the other bush willows and one of the reasons the latin name for this tree is combritum herensis is because of the herero's people's use of this as cattle fodder in a time of drought so they will collect masses of these seeds to feed cows at a time of drought now i have seen buffalo eat them and i have seen buffalo eat them this year which is very unusual so obviously there's something to that number six continues on with the exact same seed now Here's my knife again. The uh, herorensis is also apparently, I've never tasted it myself, but if you open up the seed, I'm not going to taste it now. So, of course, the wings are the dispersal mechanism. The seed is actually on the inside. There we go. It smells quite nice. So there we go. That's the that's actual seed. Now, apparently those roasted and ground make very good coffee substitute and uh, has a similar effect as stimulant uh, as coffee. I'm not sure how effective it is. Ryan, do you see what I see? Ant. Oh, oh yes. can't it. Oh, there we go. Well, there's, the, there's an ant that came outside of the inside of that, um, uh, that seed. So obviously other little insects can get in. And I think if we look quite carefully on that, it looks like those ants have actually been chewing on the, on the seed. Isn't that amazing. So that, that, that actually, that worked. That worked. What's that number? Seven. That was number seven. Sure. And I only came with five. So that's the amazing thing if you start looking a bit closer. Well, let's let them disperse to the wind. Aha. Number eight.
Do you know what that is, Brian? I do. What is it? It's a knob thorn knob. Exactly. Well done, Brian. So the acacia nigrescence, or the knob thorn, uh, produces, specifically when they're young, these big knobs. Uh, and it's actually a modified thorn. So you can actually see the old hook tip of the hook thorn there. So it's a mod modified thorn that the tree will produce. Oh, this one always gets glob globulin. So it's a hormone, a growth hormone that you get in plants, and they will pump it into a thorn to create an armored knob to protect them from different things feeding. So there we go, the knob thorns knob. And it is just a modified thorn. So it would have started life off as just a tiny little hook thorn, and then the tree would have produced globulin, the hormone into it, and that would have caused it to become this armored knob. And you, I love the way if you look at it carefully, you can see the sort of growth stages in the little layers as they go up. Hmm, there we go. That was number eight. Ah, uh, we've got nine, 10, 11, and 12 all in one branch if we wanted them, you know, but I'm not gonna spoil you too much. I'm only gonna give you 10. So this is a, often called an apple leaf, uh, but the common name I grew up knowing it as is a rain tree. So particularly in this time of the year when you don't get as bigger ones here in the Sabi Sands as we used to get in Botswana, there are some in Kruger. Now there's a cup. Okay, quickly across to the lions. We've been having a wonderful time here, everybody. They came across a herd of impala and the lioness was torn between trying to hunt them and then well, waiting to see what her cubs would do. And the impala were completely oblivious. And then eventually, I don't know if they heard maybe the cubs calling or they heard um, because the cubs didn't shut up. They wouldn't shut up. And the lioness was sort of perched like this thinking about going off to hunt the impala, although there was no chance. I mean, she was huge sort of open area between them. And eventually they picked her up and now they're still over there watching. And there have been alarm calling now. And as soon as they spotted them, the lioness moved her cubs out from cover and they're now still heading towards Biffleshook Dam. Watch your heads there, everybody. Vimpy, you okay there? And they've just come out of the block onto what we call Hippo Pools Road and they're heading down towards the dam. Oh. Now, Viam is of the opinion that the rest of the pride could easily be down here. I think that's quite a good guess. Either on a kill or perhaps just over here and not necessarily eating anything. Come on, Wendy, roll. Come on, Wendy. Come on, Wendy. That's it. Not going to roll this year, Viam. No. <laughs> Let's carry on. We'll just get up a little head of steam and then we'll switch off once we're over the top of this. There we go. Where are they going? The dam is straight ahead of us. I wonder if. I mean, I can't believe that they're going to. The little cubs are going to set the direction they're going. They've gone off the road. Maybe because, like kids, they want to take the shortcut they can see. Perhaps it's a slightly shorter route round there. And then we're now on a fairly large slope and this car still won't roll. We've got a flat tyre back there. Mm, it seem to be alright everyone. Just this deeply aged car. So they're still going down towards the water. Hmm. Possibly less than hard tyre on the right here. Yes, we're losing we're losing air. I'm not surprised. <laughs> it's alright, we'll just keep going down to the water hole. Look, one of them fell over there.
Right, let's see now. Are there others going to arrive? And while we're driving along here, just be aware that those six lionesses and the male that are on the buffalo kill have been identified as the Torchwood Pride, but that the male with them is one of the Birmingham's. Which means, of course, that the Birmingham's are not lurking only in the territories of the Ingohumas and the Sticks. They're obviously going further east into the Kruger as well. <laughs> they're running. Uh, Mercedes, you're not going to like my answer to this. You're in California. Thank you for telling us where you are. Very well done. Um, you say when they, young, when the females have grown up, will the Birmingham boys try and mate with them, or will they only mate with the mothers and aunts? I'm afraid they will try and mate with them. Yes, and that's not a problem as far as genetics goes for lions. They can apparently have up to six generations of inbreeding before there are any deleterious effects. But at the same time, it was also one of the reasons why lion coalitions don't last too much longer than two and a half years on average. They normally get tossed out by then, and that's so that that inbreeding that will in inevitably occur um, doesn't occur. Uh, because the lions will breed with their daughters, have young cubs, those cubs will be killed by the incoming males. And so that does reduce, although that infanticide is a horrific thing to have to watch and experience. Look at them running. Uh, if what the infanticide does, it does reduce inbreeding, definitely. Look at him. <laughs> Shouting at mum, going, ow, ow, ow. That is just too sweet. I cannot believe that those tiny little things are going to one day look like a big Birmingham boy male lion and this very intimidating female. The tire looks okay. <laughs> Hello Blobbit McBlob. Yes, you've asked a very difficult question. And it's a good one. Why do male lions kill lionesses when they take over a territory? Blobbit, they don't always. It's not that uncommon. The Mapoho, though, were very uncommon in that they were vicious and they killed, I think, nine or ten lionesses uh, during their takeover. The Birmingham boys killed quite a few as well. And I'm not sure, we're not sure what the biological reason for it is. I think it's got quite a lot to do with whether there are, whether there are cubs around. Um, we thought maybe the Inkohuma pride, which was decimated, they lost three lionesses to the Birmingham boys. Whether the fact that they were trying to maybe protect a young male who was still in the pride, junior, whether they were perhaps trying to protect him and that maybe got the male's blood up and caused a problem, that's possible. We don't really know. But yes, on the surface of it, it would definitely seem like a biologically profoundly idiotic thing to do, would be to kill the potential mothers of your offspring. Especially when you have such a short time in charge. So I'm wondering if we can get down to the... No, we'll go there on the other side. And apparently it is raining on Cheetah Plains, which is quite nice news, isn't it? Not nice news for Brent, who's obviously caught in the deluge, but quite nice for the area. It's keeping an eye. And he's comp Brent apparently is complaining about the fact that he didn't have his rain pants and rain coat. I don't either. I don't blame him. Hmm? He doesn't have rain, doesn't have rain pants, says Viam. He's, he's delusional about his wardrobe, everyone. I wonder the rest of the prize not up here. But maybe these chaps will go and have a drink. Let's try and ease our way around here. Just get 
get into a position. Ah! He also, Brent says he bought rain pants when he went to Rwanda. That was very clever of him. I think rain pants are one of the most underrated pieces of equipment you can possibly own. I don't have any rain pants. But a Land Rover is specifically designed to funnel rain into your groin from the steering wheel, so rain pants are a very good idea. Um, almost thinking about picking the cub up, but these cubs are too big to be, well, I mean, if she had to, she could carry them. Okay, we're going to be quiet again. So they come past. I think she's going to have a drink of what can only be described as some cream soda coloured pea soup. She didn't like that, did she, Viam? <laughs> Sorry, madam, I don't mean to be in your way. <laughs> Did you see him fall there? Shame. And there mum's having a drink now from some different pea soup. We really are completely in the wrong place now. They can drink for quite a while sometimes. I'm going to move now everyone so we can get around the other side of them. Sorry VMP, I got you into a bad position there. I do apologize. I know you like to make beautiful art all the time, not just some of the time. I'll just watch out for the rest of the pride there as I reverse down here. I'll just go down here. Yeah, there's, I can feel the wind coming up a bit. That rain might come down here. At least we're a little bit closer than Brenty is. <laughs> there you are, Vim. Justin, um... Very nice question from you about discipline in lion society. What would a lioness do if her, she chose to go a certain way and her cubs refused to go with her or do what she told them? Um, corporal punishment very, very much still the fashion with lion society. And so what you'll find, Justin, is that they don't disobey. If they disobey, they get smacked very hard and there's never much doubt in their minds as to what, what they're supposed to be doing. Now they come closer to us again. They do like to approach the vehicle, which is disconcerting with a mother like theirs. Now they're just exploring, having a little bit of fun. And wondering why yesterday when they were here it was so warm and now it's windy and cold. And one of them is watching, is watching mum, but also watching a three-banded plover. <laughs> In fact, it's starting to call at the three-banded plover. It's going ow, ow, at that bird as it moves. <laughs> Hello, Micah. You're wondering at what age these little things are going to start hunting with their mum or with the rest of the pride. They'll start accompanying the pride on hunts probably from about eight months or so, but they'll hang back. They won't be part of the pride, uh, part of the hunt. From a year, they tend to get a little bit more involved, but they tend to make a hash of things. They're only really sort of fully contributing members of the pride from about two years. So they've got two years to kind of get used to 
used to the life of a lion. I don't know what they're looking at. They feel obviously very safe here with their mum. And they do drink a lot when they decide to drink. They don't have to drink much, but they do drink a lot when they do. And this water is hardly water. I mean, there's really very little H2O in it now. It's largely buffalo dung, terrapin scum, algae, bird droppings, snail detritus, hippo dung. And now the little cubs are trying to drink. <laughs> oh dear. Here it comes everybody. Here comes the deluge. Well, I say that, I felt a spot of rain. I'm probably being a little dramatic. You might just be able to hear the pitter-patter. See, she is constantly aware, constantly aware of what's going on around her. Okay, it is going to, it's now starting, everyone. We're going to stay here. I'm just going to, while you watch the lions, cover up a few things. So that should it start in earnest, uh, we won't have too much trouble. You see how much she's drinking? I mean, she's putting away litres and litres of water there. And I think that's probably as a result of the fact that she's quite thirsty after whatever she ate last night. And I'm also very interested to know where the rest of the pride is and what they ate. Because I'm sure that she would have contributed to a hunt and then gone back to the cubs. I too have got absolutely no rain equipment here. Well, we've got a cover for the car, but not for me. Or Vian. Vian, have you got your raincoat with you? You do? You don't have the pants, okay. It's not teeming out of the sky, we're okay for now. As I say that. Talking to them, it's so interesting to hear the difference in their voices. She's going, oh, oh, and they making that lovely high-pitched squealing lion sound that they make. All right, let's see where they go now. Um, Christy, I'm sure it must make a slight difference. You say, does the state of the water affect the lioness's milk? I'm sure it must infect it in some way. I don't think it necessarily um, affects it negatively, though. Lions and leopards specifically will drink this foul kind of water if you look at, look at it as we drive past it. I mean, you wouldn't put your face in that. And if you did, you'd certainly spend quite a lot of the uh, coming weeks in an outhouse. But I don't think it'll affect her milk... Um, nearly as much as the quality of the meat she eats. That's definitely going to make a huge difference to the amount of milk she eats, especially the amount of fat. Now we've spoken extensively about the drought, we've sto spoken extensively about the effect on the predators, and we've said, well, you know, it probably has quite a good effect on the predators because they can catch uh, so much more. There's a lot of many weakened herbivores around. But the other thing to consider if you're a lactating female is that in order to make good meat, milk, you need fat. Very few of the animals out here have any fat on them at all, and the fat that there is is in the bone marrow and in the organs. And of course, if an herbivore is nutritionally stressed during a drought, that, those fat reserves are going to be the first nutritional reserves that are used up in the body, which means that inevitably their predators are going to get less of that fat, which means that's going to affect her milk. So a drought will not be a good thing for a mother trying to feed her cubs. Although, I mean, these ones are in prime condition. They, you compare them with the skinny little, um, with the skinny little.
little uh, sticks cubs that we had the other day. These chaps are stocky and fine. I think she's going to lie them under this tree as the rain starts to patter down. Unless she goes towards the drainage line on Nyala Road North where we first met them. Hi guys. Ah, uh, no, I can't believe that we've had this day with him. <laughs> you see how stocky they are? They're fat little bellies. They remind me a little of my nephew William. I won't tell his father that. <clears throat> Are they calling mum? Yeah, Aaron, I agree with you. I haven't spent much time with the older ones, but you say you reckon that these chaps are a bit more talkative than their older cousins. Yeah. Yeah, I think you could well be right. It's in the road there. And mum is sniffing on a quarry bush, of course and doing the Fleming grimace, interpreting what she smells, because of course what happens there is that is a quarry bush where and it would have been marked by probably a, the other lionesses or even a male, maybe even a leopard. <laughs> Viem's now pointing at the sky. Do you think you need to put the rain cover on? And the sun just came out. And, then, <laughs> and the sun came out. We're having a bit of a monkey's wedding as they call them. You sneak forward a bit. Will you just tell me when you want to put the rain cover on? I'm not thinking, ooh, forgot about that one in front of us. Okay, we're going to have to put the rain cover on everyone. Um, we can stay live while we do that, it just will look a little bit odd. So I'm not sure what Brent's situation is, but you go for it, Viam. <laughs> it's quite nice, little bit of rain that we're having here. We just need to be a little bit careful about... Yeah, you know what, I'm going to move back a bit. Yeah, let's move back a bit. We can't put the covers on with the lion here. The cubs are going to react badly to it. So let's go across to Brent and find out what's happening with him. It is starting to rain a bit now. Three. Oh, well, while James moves out, we're still, as you can see, doing uh, the last of uh, the rain covers. And you can see I'm probably quite opaque or through all the little spots on the lens. Uh, Brian is nearly ready. Give him a few seconds. Okay, so very ex so I know James is with those the lioness and the three cubs. Apparently, there are six lionesses in Torchwood, and no one is sure who they are. The sticks are down to the south of us, so it could be the Torchwood Pride, or it could be, I think, uh, I think the Torchwood Pride's got six lionesses. I'm not sure. I've never seen them before, but very interesting. And I wonder with the lack of the water uh, in Kruger and to the to the east there, maybe they're pushing further in to the west because there are pump water holes. And all the animals they eat are moving towards those water holes. Now, very good news for the sunset safari. I'm not going to tell you what it is yet, but I haven't forgotten. Uh, it started raining, so we had skedaddle from Cheetah Plans, but I had, I think it was number nine and ten of the stop and look around game and it is as i said this is a rain tree a pultiforum oh no sorry i have a it <laughs> a philanoptera uh, valacea but the two interesting things about sorry this cam drive channel is making lots of noise um i'll wait for brian to clean the lens before continuing There we go. Okay, so we're looking at uh, the rain tree. 
uh, or an apple leaf, as I said, where I, I grew up, they were called rain trees as opposed to apple leaves. Now, there's two reasons why they're called the, the rain tree. One is when the leaves dry out, and, and especially at this time of the year, the bigger individuals, when, they, when the wind blows, it doesn't really work on a little branch, but it does sound like rain on a roof. Uh, but the other reason, the more important reason that they're called rain trees is that during this time of the year, when it's very dry, they're one of the favored food species for a little bug called a spittle bug. And what a spittle bug will do is it'll attach itself to one of the stems like this, and sometimes en masse, hundreds of thousands of them on a single tree. And what they do is they eat so fast that they excrete a drop of almost pure water uh, every couple of seconds. So if you're sitting under uh, a rain tree in a very dry year and there's not a cloud in the sky and the sun is shining and you start getting rained on, you actually are being urinated on by little bugs called the spittle bugs. And uh, there we go. There's our 10 interesting facts from the stop. We're back on Juma now and I'm going to head down towards the southwest to see what's happening in that part of the reserve. Okay, while well, we make our way down to the southwest, uh, let's see how James is going and putting his rain covers on. We've decided not to put the rain covers on, everyone. The sun came out, it stopped raining. Well, it's still drizzling a bit, but this is going to be the last view we get of these cubs, I'm afraid. They're going into a block that is extremely difficult, if not impossible, to get into, and I think we've had such a wonderful view of them that I'm tempted to just let them go in there without following them. Well, we can't follow them through here. We could try again this afternoon, and I think that's precisely what we will do. What an incredible morning we've had with them. Phew! Some nice pictures, I think, William. I probably got 200 pictures. Um, I will probably keep one of them. Can upload it onto blurry safaris. We'll upload it to blurry safaris. Thank you. Thank you for that, Vim. Good. Blurry safaris, of course, the Instagram account of Eggsy. Why he has decided this is a good thing to do, I'm not sure. But if you like blurry pictures of the wilderness, Eggsy on safari is where you should go on Instagram. Oh dear. Yeah, now it is starting to come down. Alright, we're going to start heading for home, I think. Right, they've gone down through there. We're not going to see them again. I'm going to get under a tree. Woo! Now, now we got proper rain. What do you think, Vim? Is it time? Okay, we've got to put the covers on, everyone. We're now in proper a proper rain rain cloud. This is Viam's apron. Very nice. You need the other one first, or the apron? We need the big one. Okay. Right. Let's go across to Brent while we do this. See you just now. Okay. Well, we're heading, still heading steadily west, and I've heard something which is going to be very exciting for the Sunset Safari, but I'm not going to give it away. You're going to have to wait for the Sunset Safari to find out what incredible thing is an Arethusa. Now at the moment there's a lot of cars there, but we'll be there first on the Sunset Safari, so I'm going to let all of those all of you out there ponder, what could Brent and Brian be going to look at on the Sunset Safari? The killer bees? Aim to please, that's all you can know. Oh, I'm so funny today, Brian.
So we asked, asked a question a little bit earlier about what protects uh, from livestock encroachment. And what I meant by that is what protects wild animals moving through, I mean, uh, pre pre prevents domestic animals moving through into an area where there are wild animals. What is the best preventative in the world to keep domestic livestock moving into wild areas? Oh, baboons! Highly mobile baboons. Oh, I can't see my monitor. <laughs> there we go. And look, there's a cowboy, a baby riding on the mom's back. At least they're not as nervous as they were a couple of months ago. They do tend to sit for a little bit longer. Just maybe try. Inch forward slightly. I think. So what they were doing is feeding on the fruiting jackalberry. Yeah. Can't see, there could be quite a few more in the troop. And we only saw about, only saw about 10. Could be a small troop, but this is normally in this area quite a big troop. I love the way the baboons walk. They do walk like they've got swagger, attitude. But when they look at you, they have a look of absolute guilt. Like they've just done something wrong, or they're about to do something wrong. An incredibly adaptable primate. Now, baboons are omnivores. So they eat fruit, insects, birds, eggs, seeds and even meat. If they can catch a little scrub hare or, or a bird, a baby bird. And also, during the impala lambing season, the big male baboons uh, are, have been known to grab a baby impala. Okay, they've calmed down a bit, so I'm going to try to get a little bit closer again. But they were in this massive jackalberry that's fruiting at the moment. I think when we move away, I think they'll probably come straight back here. Oh no, they're on the, on the move again. moving up the edge of the Mawati River, probably stopping and checking all the jackalberries that might be fruiting. And this is a quite a popular area for baboons to forage. Lots of potential food around. Look at that guy, his cheeks are so full, one on the right. Now, baboon uh, being a primate can be a little bit greedy and uh, will keep anything they can find to eat in their cheeks to stop the other baboons having access to them. And you can see that massive round cheek. So they, they have quite complex social structures like most large primates. So there are a group of alpha males known as dog baboons. A big male baboon is known as a dog baboon. And uh, they are in control of the rest of the troop. And they can be very aggressive with troop members. And it's a constant, look at that, you can see his cheek full of food. Oh, and that one's got double cheeks. So as we're, as we're saying about the, the social structure, now if any of those dominant males get injured, the rest of the males will attack him immediately to try get his spot in the social hierarchy. Now, Michael's wondering if I've ever been to Cape Town, where the baboons run riot, uh, and wonders why they do. Well, Michael, it's very, very, very simple why the baboons run riot in Cape Town. It's because of human beings. 
We are messy, messy creatures. We don't throw away our rubbish. So baboons will forage in rubbish. And as soon as they learn, being a primate, they have quite a high capacity for learning. Uh, as soon as they find out that if they get into a house, there's lots of high nutrients and high, high value food for very little effort. I'm just going to roll forward, Ryan, see if we can get them in a gap. So, uh, oh, there we go. Oh no. So, uh, basically, it's learned behavior uh, from foraging of human beings. And uh, it's our fault that those baboons uh, become so brazen and aggressive. Now, a baboon, a brazen and aggressive baboon that's lost its natural fear of human beings is an incredibly dangerous animal. And uh, they are capable of inflicting massive damage on a person. And they're a big male baboon's canines are actually longer than a lion's. Oh, I've spotted another animal. And it's my favorite antelope species. I'm just going to see if we can get a nice view of her. And probably of all the antelopes, one of the ones we see the least. Let's just try to get a view of her. They're so pretty and so dainty. Okay, so Brian's just taking the rain cover off. Of course, as soon as we get all the rain covers on, the sunshine comes out. So there we go. Off it goes. Um, do you see her there, Brian? She's just through that little acacia knob thorn thicket. I'm hoping she moves, pops her head up. There we go. A little female bushbuck. Now, I think she's also on her way to feed under the jackalberry tree. Now, bushbuck, you will quite often find feeding alongside a troop of baboons, and anything that they messily drop from high up in the tree, uh, the bushbuck will take advantage. There's a few species that do that, and Yala and Pala as well, will also feed under a troop of baboons. Now, Penny Pine is wondering, do baboons have the same alarm call as gorillas? We're just going to watch her. I think she's going to pop out into the open. And watch the way she walks. So watch where her front feet are. And even when she's whoop, jogging, she puts her back foot almost exactly where her front foot's been. Because they live in thickets and that, they try and minimize any sound they might make that might give away their presence to predators. And she's just spotted the baboons. I think she's she probably been listening to them for a while. But she looks like she's just seen them. They're up ahead in the river, in the riverbed. So let's let, let her go continue to forage with her primate friends. And I don't want to make too much noise around the bushbuck and the baboon. So a penny, I am, have not forgotten about your your uh, question about do baboons make uh, the same alarm calls as gorillas but we'll do that when we get back because James has definitely got one of the most beautiful birds of prey we get here at Juma. James has got two of the most beautiful birds of prey that we find here at Juma. Two African hawk eagles, everybody, sitting on a tree looking for a guinea fowl or a franklin to devour. You can see it has ceased. It's raining. Uh, and just to be clear, while we enjoy the sight of those African hawk eagles, uh, the rain that we had today does not count as far as the rain bet is gone. I said, I think, 10th of October. Uh, Brian said 10th of September, I think Brent said 10th of November, something like that. That will be the first 20 millimeter rain that we have. This one that we've just had has probably been ooh, maybe three millimeters, that's all. Not even that, probably not even a millimeter. Ah, Brian said 20th of September. And you said, you said 1st of uh, October, did you, Vian? Okay. I'll, I'll stick with it. Okay, well, you have to now. It's on record. 
Mm. Well, yes, it's always a guess. Even if you have all the data in the world, it's a guess. So one of the few eagle species that spends all their time together. The Wahlbergs do it, the Marshalls do not, the Tawnies do not. Oh, we're off. Let's see. And you can hear, as he took off, the squirrels were going... The grey go-away birds going... That's very interesting. So they'll all shout as they fly down the drainage line looking for something like a guinea fowl. They will take a squirrel, absolutely. Just listening now and you can hear them, the calls receding as they fly down the drainage line. Very nice. Egg. African hawk eagle. Nice. As you can see that the deluge has ceased, so we can take that off my leggies. <laughs> Hello Jason, what a very interesting story you've read. You've read that it is you've yeah, you've read that inbreeding in birds can cause them to sing off key and that therefore this can affect their ability to mate. Well we know of course that birds sing in order to attract mates and for territoriality. I think that's fascinating and it's fascinating because I've been helping uh, we're trying to create a kind of a safari live sound for our stories, a sort of introduction sound and the directive is we can only use natural sounds and maybe a little bit of human instruments and I've been trying to find the exact notes that a chin spot batis makes and it would seem to be the three that I found online that have been recorded it goes E flat D to um, E flat D to B, E flat D B those are the three notes that it makes. Is that correct? No. E flat DC. E flat DC is what it does. And two or three different birds from different recordings have been on that key. So that's really interesting that you say that it seems to be that uh, birds will sing in a specific key and if they inbreed then that will change. I think that's just amazing. <laughs> Okay, that's going to be it from us, everyone. Thank you very much for joining us on our little lion excursion today. It was an enormous fun time we had with those little cubs. Thank you, Vim. And uh, thank you for putting up with the rain and for talking to us during the course of the drive. We'll see you this afternoon at 3 o'clock. Bye-bye. Oh, welcome back. Penny, you are wondering about gorilla versus baboon distress calls and alarms. Uh, gorillas sort of roar rather than bark like a baboon. The baboons are that different. Wow! 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 Um, but now I've actually, strange enough, recorded gorilla alarms and chest beats. Now this is a, a, a lowland forest gorilla warning us. Yeah, so that doo -doo -doo is obviously the gorilla beating its chest, and then that Rah! is the is the scream. Now that is a quite a common sound when you're tracking lowland gorillas. Very uncommon when you're tracking mountain gorillas that are very habituated. So quite often uh, that's a a warning if you if you surprise them. Uh, other times they actually display like that to each other. So that particular case is actually wasn't a warning at us. It was a a display at another silverback who was in the area. And uh, when you often walk into uh, Western Lowland Gorillas, which I've spent a lot more time with, I've only been to the Mountain Gorillas once, uh, and you bump into a silverback and he gets a fright, <laughs> he screams like a little girl. It's much more high-pitched. I think I might have... Um, what have I done now? Oh, I pushed the wrong button. Um, but I'll have to save that for the <laughs> sun, sunset safari. But they literally, you, you suddenly, as you see the gorilla through the forest, they go, Wah! 
ah, and then they run away. <laughs> Even though he weighs double what we do. Uh, but it's been great having you on the Sunrise Safari and so fantastic you got to spend some awesome time with the Inkahuma Lioness and her cubs. Sounds like it was spectacular. Brian and I are hoping to produce some spectacular things on the Sunset Safari. Bye.